Well, thank you. It's uh, wonderful to be here. I'm Max Carter, and I'll give a more uh, fulsome uh, introduction in a moment. But I just uh, have to comment, this is my first time here at Betsy Jeff Penn in 23 years. My wife, Jane, taught at New Garden Friends School and brought groups here quite often. Uh, but we're going to end up this, this hour together talking about a rather controversial subject, Israel, Palestine, and you know, Quaker uh, relations there and some of our service learning trips. So I'll start off with something that could be controversial here as well, but I'll just touch on it. Uh, 23 years ago when I was here the, the last time, I was leading a group of Guilford College students who were first years in our Quaker Leadership Scholars Program. And one of those young people from New England Yearly Meeting was named Doug Logan. And I still have a strong memory of Doug on the ropes course, climbing that telephone pole, perched on the very top of it, and frozen solid, not being able to, to jump. Uh, well, fast forward to post Guilford College graduation, and Doug Logan is the founder and CEO of Cyber Ninjas. Uh, the, <laughs> the uh, computer security organization that was uh, hired to do the audit in Arizona. Uh, so he took the plunge, uh, not necessarily off the telephone pole, but into the politics of all of that. Uh, interesting evolution of young Doug. Uh, but anyway, uh, in the hour we have together, I'm going to be talking about three basic things. So I hope I'll get to all three of them and keep each one of them short enough that we actually have plenty of time for questions and, and answers. Uh, the first is to simply give a very brief introduction to Quakerism and how Quakers came to have especially two testimonies that we'll focus on today, one of peace and of equality, uh, which are quite germane <laughs> to what your work is and the interests of uh, this conference. Uh, the second section is going to be about how some of that has played out in the history of Quakers here in North Carolina, uh, especially in the counties just south of us here in what was known as the Piedmont Triad. Uh, and then the third section is going to be how I wound up in the Middle East uh, with the strong interest that my wife and I have in the Israeli-Palestinian situation and what we do with our service learning trips when uh, we're not in COVID, our annual, <laughs> if not uh, two or three times a year. So that's the plan. And then I hope we'll have plenty of time for your questions and, and the interaction. Then we'll be hanging out at lunch, so if you have additional questions. And some of that is incorporated in my little book over there, uh, Palestine and Israel, A Personal Encounter. That is a sort of memoir of my first 35 years of encounter over there from 1970 to 2005. And the sequel's coming out sometime when a small little Quaker press in Newburgh, Oregon finally gets around to it. Uh, so anyway, uh, again, Max Carter, I retired six years ago from uh, directing Quaker studies and the Friends Center at Guilford College, uh, Quaker schools just south of here in Greensboro, founded in 1837. And before that, I grew up in Indiana on a small dairy farm. Uh, so if you can't hear me in the back, I can go into my Hoosier hog call voice and, uh, um, and ramp it up a bit. And grew up in a largely Quaker community in what is known as the Quaker Belt of central Indiana. It's the Midlands of Indiana where all those North Carolina and Virginia Quakers migrated to in the early 1800s in their anti-slavery migrations. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk a bit about that in the context of Quaker work here. Now, a bit about Quakerism. And again, I taught a whole semester. <laughs> so I got to do the reduced Shakespeare version of, uh, of this. Quakerism emerged in the English Civil War period of the 1640s and 50s. And if you spend enough time in the, the American South, you know that uh, the Civil War isn't over yet. <laughs> um, what was it, Steinbeck who said the, uh, the past isn't uh, dead, it's not even past. And it certainly is true here. And it's also true in England. The Civil War period 
had a profound impact on even contemporary England about democracy, the rights of the communist people, the realm. And Quakers emerged out of that social, political, and religious milieu. The Puritans, the Commonwealth, and the Diggers, and the Levelers, and the Muggletonians, and the Fifth Monarchists, and when you lock off the head of your king, as he did in 1649, it's kind of a basic statement about what they thought of authority, and Quakers emerged out of that. It's kind of a left-wing Puritan movement that felt the Puritans hadn't gone far enough. What Quakerism emphasized was restorationism, the restoration of original Christianity, which they felt the church had abandoned and gone into this state-church relationship that compromised the teachings of Jesus. And so the Sermon on the Mount was very important to them, uh, but also the apocalyptic understanding that Christ is present. We don't have to wait for a future uh, millennium, a future apocalypse. The Spirit of Christ is present now as a light within everyone. What Quaker shorthand for is that of God in everyone. And of course that leads directly to our testimony of equality. If everyone has that light of God, that light of Christ uh, in them, then everyone is radically equal. And, and that also plays into the peace testimony too. If you have that understanding of the other, you're not as likely to wipe them out because they have that of God in them as well. But anyway, the restorationist impulse uh, was shared with those Anabaptist folk over on the continent, the, the Mennonites, the Amish, the Hutterites, what became known as the Peace Church tradition, who took Jesus' teachings in the Sermon that quite seriously, that when Jesus said, love your enemies, he probably didn't mean kill them. And <laughs> Quakers took that quite seriously. And George Fox, uh, one of the founders of the Quaker movement, was imprisoned in 1650 for the blasphemy of saying that Christ and God dwelt in mortal flesh. I mean, remember the Puritans, if you, if you remember that great essay by Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, we are loathsome insects dangling by a slender thread over the very pits of hell, and there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. Uh, well, that was the understanding of humanity. <laughs> Quakers didn't buy that, because if there's that of God within you, you're a temple. You're a temple of the divine. Uh, so that was blasphemy for the Puritans, and Fox got clapped in jail. And while he was there, again, during the Civil War period, he was offered early release if he would join the militia and be a captain and use his leadership skills in, in the war. And he refused with what became kind of a classic articulation of the Quaker peace testimony. I can't because I live in the virtue of that life and power which takes away the occasion for war. And if you are centered in that light that teaches peace, reconciliation, equality of all, then what cause do you have of fighting uh, and warring? Uh, the simplicity testimony emerges out of that, those same teachings, and a lot of violence, a lot of war comes with, you've got something I want, you won't give it to me, so I'll take it by force. If you don't have that need for greed, then that takes away another occasion for war. A belief that there's that of God in the other person takes another occasion for war away. So anyway, Quakers emerged out of that time with a strong peace testimony. And we'll talk a bit about the implications of that in a moment. Well, Quakers wound up here in North Carolina in the mid-1700s. Uh, actually, they stepped foot here in 1665 out on the coast when Quakers were escaping persecution up in New England. I don't know if you remember this, but uh, the Puritans who wound up here uh, with others seeking religious freedom, um, sought religious freedom for themselves, not necessarily for everyone else. And so it was actually a capital offense to be caught driving while Quaker in Boston until 1660. Um, not the Quakers bear grudges. We can still remember the, the ones they hanged. William Robinson, William Ledger, and Marmaduke Stevenson, and Mary Dyer <laughs> were all hanged by the Puritans in Boston for the crime of being Quaker. For one reason, 
You didn't want Quakers in the colony because how do you get rid of the Indians if you don't have people willing to fight and kill them? Literally, that was one of the reasons. Also, Quakers didn't support the clergy, the established church. They wouldn't pay their church tithes. You don't want them in your colony. So many of them fled to the Carolinas, the back country where there was no established church. They hid out in the Great Dismal Swamp where no one could find them. And George Fox himself visited them in 1672. But the Quakers who settled here in the uh, Piedmont Triad in the middle part of North Carolina came down the old Philadelphia Wagon Road in the 1740s and 50s. Also to escape war up in the uh, seven, days, seven Years' War, the French and Indian War. It was crowded. Land was expensive. There were some acreage you couldn't buy for less than five cents an acre. It was darn expensive. And as a Daniel Boone once said, uh, a disowned Quaker from Reading, Pennsylvania, if you can see the smoke from a neighbor's chimney, it's already too crowded. And it was getting crowded in southeastern Pennsylvania. So they came down to Philadelphia Wagon Road and settled in the counties just south of here, near Forsyth, Alamance, Chatham, Randolph, Guilford counties. Coming from southeastern Pennsylvania, and later joined by Quakers from Nantucket, all the uh, uh, whalers who uh, populated Nantucket, the Coffins, the Macy's, the Starbucks, the Folgers, all the coffee names, uh, wound up here also because it was getting crowded and the whales were moving off. Well, those two communities, Nantucket and southeastern Pennsylvania, were incubators for the Quaker abolitionist movement. <laughs> Those Quaker sailors had seen the Middle Passage. They had seen the slave plantations in the Caribbean, and they were radically opposed to slavery. And southeastern Pennsylvania was where the first white European protest against slavery was written in 1688, the Germantown Remonstrance, by Quakers and Mennonites who had migrated to Penn's colony in 1683 and were shocked that Quakers owned slaves. Quakers were enslavers, in fact, at a higher percentage at that time than anyone else because they were the first there. They were the wealthy ones. And slavery was an economic system. And these Mennonites and Quakers who escaped persecution in Europe couldn't believe that Quakers would be inv involved in something that contradicted everything Quakers believed. The peace testimony, slavery is a violent system. Equality, <laughs> simplicity, this is again, you misapply your power and enslave people for your own economic well-being. And uh, the integrity of your Christian witness. Could integrity is another key Quaker testimony. Of not only truthfulness, but integrating what you say you believe with how you live your life, walking the talk, or harmonizing your practice with your principles. And from 1688, in that Germantown Remonstrance, which was based simply on a one-page document saying, you know, Sermon on the Mount and the Golden Rule teach us not to do anything to others that you wouldn't want to have done to you. Would any of us want to be enslaved? No. Then why are we doing this? Well, that bubbled up, and if any of you know about Quakerism, Quakers in their own business don't vote. We have to achieve unity before we move forward with a decision. Believe me, if there's truth, then we can arrive at truth if we center ourselves, access that light of truth within us, and we can come to unity. Uh, it can take a long time for Quakers to make decisions, and it took 90 years or so for Quakers to reach a sense of the meeting that slavery was inconsistent with the gospel of Christ, with Quaker teachings, with Quaker testimonies. But by 1776, Quakers in Philadelphia had gotten rid of their involvement with slavery. Now it's from that area that the first Quakers came, and from Nantucket. So they came into this area with deep abolitionist principles. And I'll just tell a few stories of that before we move into the third uh, section of uh, this, this hour of uh, the Middle East. The Quakers arrive here and eventually develop in North Carolina an anti-slavery position in 1778, just after Philadelphia. It's illegal to free your enslaved persons in North Carolina. 
So they had to come with all kinds of ways around that. One was Quakers who had been enslavers handed over the title of their enslaved persons to the yearly meeting, the Organization of Quakers in North Carolina, for the purpose of their being, the technical term was Quaker free Negroes. They were free, but they were technically owned by this church organization, which was legal at the time. Churches can own property. The Quakers, as an organization in North Carolina, were the largest slaveholders in North Carolina. <laughs> between 800 and 1,000 enslaved persons for the purpose of their being free. Now, of course, that doesn't always work because the main problem at that time, with uh, before we had the Underground Railroad, was kidnapping free blacks. And so even if you were technically owned or a free Quaker free Negro, you could be kidnapped. And so Quakers got involved in recolonization societies, uh, loading up those who were willing to go back to Africa or to Haiti. Of course, that doesn't work. You re-enslave quickly, and the situation there wasn't great. So eventually, Quakers in the Piedmont got involved in the illegal activity of the Underground Railroad. Now, there's a whole history to all of this, uh, but I'll just share one story. 1819 is the origins of what we know as the first activity of what became known as the Underground Railroad in Central North Carolina, possibly in the entire state. Now, it wasn't called the Underground Railroad until much later for a basic reason. 1819, Railroads hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> so anyway, so here's the story. 1819, you got this anti-slavery population of Quakers in the Piedmont, in the New Garden community. One of the most famous of those abolitionists was Vestal Coffin. He was a known abolitionist. He had helped kidnap uh, uh, free blacks before, used the court system even, to gain their freedom. He was a founder of the state's first manumission society, trying to convince others to free their enslaved persons. And he petitioned the legislature over and over to end slavery in the state. And he's surrounded by a community of abolitionists in the New Garden community. So one free black in his family by the name of John Dimry knows, OK, I'm a free black living in southern North Carolina, but you know, I am subject to being kidnapped, and it was happening a lot at that time. I'm going to move my family into New Garden, close to these abolitionist Quakers for that extra layer of protection. So 1819, he moves into the New Garden community, and one night, after his former owner had died, his sons decide we're going to reclaim our inheritance, and they come riding into the New Garden community, find out where John Demery's cabin is, ride up to the front door and shout out late at night, we've been out hunting, we've gotten lost, we need some assistance. John Demery steps out the door to see what he can do, and they jump him, start tying him up with ropes to haul him off and sell him into slavery. His wife comes running out to see what the commotion is. They knock her unconscious. The daughter comes running out, and before they can knock her unconscious, John Demery says, run, get Vestal Coffin, whose farm was very close by. In fact, it's only an hour, a mile from where, where we live. And she goes running through the night, grabs Vestal Coffin, you know, this known anti-slavery agitator, who grabs a neighbor and comes running back and intercepts these kidnappers and lets them know he knows the law. He's done this before. He has gone through the court system. They can be imprisoned for violating this man's rights. And if you know anything about peacemaking, if you're attacked or you're threatened with violence, uh, if you don't respond the way they're expecting, you've got the advantage for a split second. <laughs> they're expecting something else, and you're coming with something different. And in that split second, you can hopefully think <laughs> You know, flee or come up with a third way. Well, in that split second, you know, the kidnappers don't know what to do. They've never encountered anything like this. And while they're trying to you know, re-navigate, re the neighbor that Vestal Coffin picked up 
unties Demery's ropes and he springs to freedom. And the kidnappers are spooked. They hop back on their horses and hightail it out of there. And later on that night, John Demery goes to the coffin cabin and he and Vestal and his wife Alethea map out his route to Indiana, a free state, and to Richmond, Indiana, a Quaker town established by Quakers from North Carolina in 1806. Six weeks later, up, what, if you're familiar with North Carolina, essentially 52 through southern Virginia, Charleston, along the Kanawha, down to Ohio, Cincinnati, and up to Richmond, and a free state. Six weeks later, he arrives there, stays there for two years, earning enough money to send for his family to eventually join him in freedom. So 1819, as best we know, first conductor, Vestal and Alethea Coffin, first passenger, John Demery, on the Underground Railroad here. Eventually, thousands came out of the Deep South along that route. Almost impossible, because if you remember, back then, enslaved persons were kept illiterate. Uh, it was against the law uh, to teach them how to read. That way, you can't read maps, you can't read directions. Uh, there were vigilante groups and headhunters, bounty hunters, every little village along the way, and you're 450 miles from the first free state. The Underground Railroad operated on border states, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, um, Northern Virginia, because it was impossible to get out of the Deep South with all of that. And you didn't have GPS in your walking stick. So there's all kinds of stories about how they were guided by oral tradition, the old Negro spirituals, and all of it, follow the drinking gourd, wade in the water, swing low, sweet chariot. Even Deep River is a directional to the Deep River Quaker community in Guilford County. Um, and I can share some details about that over lunch. But anyway, that then led to a massive interracial civil disobedience movement here where blacks and whites were working together to get people to freedom. And later on, it led in the uh, mid-1900s to Quakers in North Carolina working for integration. Even before Brown versus Board of Education, there were Quakers working for integration and uh, famously brought Eleanor Roosevelt down in the mid-1950s to talk at Guilford College to a mixed audience of blacks and whites sitting together, which is described in the local press as a promiscuous mingling of the races. And, uh, uh, and eventually, many years later, finally were successful in integrating uh, some of the schools around here. So that's a little bit of how you incorporate your testimony of equality and peace into these nonviolent civil disobedient movements. So let me then transition into the Middle East and how Quakers have sought to bring some of those testimonies to bear on, on that situation. And I have to introduce that with a further introduction of, of myself. Now, I mentioned I'd grown up in that Quaker belt, Quaker family, both sides of which had moved out of North Carolina and Virginia in the anti-slavery migrations that reduced the Quaker population in the South from over 20,000 in the 1800s to fewer than 2,000 by the end of the Civil War. Most of them, both sides of my family, right up to Indiana, in those migrants. That's why they had to have a boarding school that became Guilford College. There had to be at least one place where Quaker families could send their children to that guarded education. And the, uh, uh, even though that was my heritage, both generations, well, in fact, about seven or eight generations on both sides, back to the origins of Quakerism, I mean, <laughs> and back then, you had to marry a Quaker or you were disowned. Uh, we lost about a third of our membership for Quakers marrying Baptists and Methodists. Uh, I had to marry a Baptist in order for my children to have any hope of mental acuity because my DNA pool had gotten that shallow. <laughs> my family tree is a trunk. <laughs> uh, Johnsons, Carters, and Bundys, and a few new ones in there. But anyway, even with that heritage, uh, and no Quaker war stories <laughs> in my family. When I was growing up in the 1950s and 60s, and I, I, from the color of hair in this room, I think some of you remember that, that era. 
this was a time of the Cold War. This is a time of deep fear and loathing of Red China. Remember, it was Red China and the Soviet Union. You know, Sputnik goes up and we freak out. And then Vietnam, the domino theory, if we don't, I actually had an uncle once who, oddly enough, was a conscious objector during World War II, who during Vietnam literally told me we have to kill the commies for Christ. I mean, that was, that was an actual slogan that some of us remember. And so I grow up with this Quaker heritage of the peace testimony, but at a time of intense Cold War understanding, we've got to stop the commies in Southeast Asia before they march across you know, America and in the Christian community that I lived in and end forever the opportunity for spreading the gospel. But if we lose religious freedom in America, how will we be able to share the gospel? I mean, this was really thick where I grew up. So I'm trying to figure out in 1964 as a sophomore in high school, what do I do when I turn 18 and the draft? Uh, you know, everything I'm hearing from my teachers, from the culture, and even from some of my family is, you know, we've got to stop the commies. And my Quaker background is saying, uh, no. <laughs> I had just about decided I was going to volunteer for the Coast Guard, figuring, okay, I'll probably never have to shoot anybody. And I'll do my service. But one summer night in 1964, the local Quaker meeting, where I grew up in Howard County, Indiana, hosted an American Friends Service Committee peace caravan. These were three young women from Philadelphia who were traveling through the Midwest trying to reintroduce to many of us the understanding of the Quaker peace testimony, which had kind of filtered away in assimilation of Quakers in the Midwest into the Protestant mainstream. I don't remember what the first two women said. The third woman was a Hiroshima maiden. And when she shared the experience of August 6, 1945, when she went out of her house for the first time in about two weeks because there had been intensive bombing to soften up the mainland for the eventual invasion. She was out playing with her brother and thinking, what a wonderful day. She didn't hear any bombers overhead for the first time in a long time. Then she heard one bomber overhead and thought to herself, what a lucky day. Only one bomber. Mm -hmm. Then a wall of flame, and she watched her family incinerated, her brother incinerated. She's behind the cement wall. She's a mile away from ground zero and survived. Mm -hmm. In the moment she shared that story, something inside of me shifted. And I realized I can't participate in any system that makes that possible. And it's not a rational decision about we'll save a million people by dropping this bomb because we won't have a land war. I just knew I couldn't participate in that. And that's when I became a conscious objector. Now, when I was turned 18 then, I had the good fortune, <laughs> in fact, for, uh, for knowledge, evidently, of uh, being born in a county chock full of Quakers, Mennonites, Brethren, and Amish, all those peace church folk. My draft board just said, fill out the form, fine. And I filled out the, the six questions. If any of you go through that, there were six questions back before the Supreme Court decided you can't ask those questions of folk. Do you believe in God? Why do you believe in God? How does your belief in God affect this? And, and on. Uh, I filled them out. My draft board said, okay, uh, you're a conscious objector. And I had a student deferment at Ball State University, so I had four years to decide where I'd do my alternative service. I knew I was going to volunteer for I wanted to do service. And I wanted to do it in a war zone. I wanted to see if I could be a peacemaker. And so I had four years to select where I would go and do my alternative service. My great aunt had taught in the Quaker schools in Ramallah, Palestine. She went in 1929, the first time. 
Those schools have been founded in 1869. Quaker chutzpah, go to the Ottoman Turkish Empire and start a school for girls. <laughs> and very successful schools, eventually a boys' school as well in 1901. And I was a teacher education major. This sounded, I heard my great aunt talk about this. I wanted to go and teach. It was a war zone. It, caught, it checked off all the boxes. So when I graduated in 1970, I volunteered and uh, went off to teach in the Ramallah Friends School. Friends Boys School taught English and, and math uh, poorly. Uh, and, uh, those two years you know, changed my life. Uh, growing up on a dairy farm in Indiana, in that culture, you don't get very far away from home, either physically or mentally. You've always got to turn around and milk the cows that night, so you don't get very far away from home. There's not much source other alternative information. Everyone within that circle is just like you, and so two years of exposure to the Middle East was mind-blowing. These were not people like me. Uh, I met Jews and Muslims and, and different kinds of Christians. I'd only know, well, to me, diversity growing up was Methodists, Baptists, Christians, and Quakers. I didn't even associate with those other kind of Quakers, those Hicksites and Wilburites over there on the other side of Indiana. So to meet all of this and different kinds of Christians, I had to go back to seminary <laughs> to try to sort it all out. That's where I met Jane, went to Earlham School of Religion. And come to an understanding that everything that I thought I knew wasn't necessarily true uh, shakes your world. Uh, I grew up fundamentalist. And if you, any of you grew up fundamentalist, you know if it's a closed system. But if you pull one of those bricks out, the whole edifice can crumble. And I had started pulling bricks out. And the whole edifice had crumbled. So I had to go to seminary to try to piece it back together. And brilliant professors who, who helped that. But in sharing with people about my experience in the Middle East, and talking about meeting Palestinians especially, because the schools with this time were all Palestinian students. This was after the Six Day War. And Jews lived there and Arabs lived here. Absolute separation. And I would describe the hospitality of Palestinians and the brilliance of my students. And people said, that's not true. No. They had this image, a stereotype of the other that they could not comprehend. I would share direct experience. <laughs> and they would tell me I was lying. And so, Eventually, Jane and I decided the only way we can share this in a way that people understand is take people there. So they didn't believe us. So that's when we started these service learning trips. It would take people for three weeks to volunteer at the Quaker schools in Ramallah, about nine miles north of Jerusalem, and travel in the area and meet Jews and Christians and Muslims and Baha'is and all those folk, and hear the experiences of each of these people from right to left. On the Palestinian side, if you know anything about the politics, we met with Hamas, with the Fatah, with the Popular Front folk. In Israel, we met with Israeli Arabs, we met with settlers, we met with soldiers, with kibbutzniks, right to left. And as an old uh, Quaker peacemaker, the name of and Bowling, who spent much of his life working on peace in the Middle East, once said, if you spend one week in the Middle East, uh, you'll be an expert. If you spend two weeks over there, you'll come back slightly confused. If you spend three weeks, you won't have a clue. <laughs> and that's pretty much true. Uh, but it's so confusing and so complex, but it's also so simple. It's about real estate. This is not a religious war. Jews and Muslims and Christian Arabs 
have lived together for millennia over there. Way back. This is not an Abrahamic tussle. These folk are cousins, and they lived together wonderfully until a lot of the movements of the last hundred, nationalism, uh, and statism, all of that emerged to be a tussle over a small piece of property about the size of New Jersey with about 12 million people in it, all with deep ties. And the last few moments before we open up the question and answer, I want to focus on a few of the people we meet with who highlight some of the possibilities of getting beyond what I think most of us in the United States, because we have limited access <laughs> to what's really going on over there, uh, uh, ought to know about the attempts to live together and find a way beyond the situation. Uh, the first group I want to talk about is the uh, Breaking the Silence group. Breaking the Silence is a group of more than a thousand Israeli veterans of the Israel Defense Forces. Men and women who served in the army, served in the occupation, saw firsthand, kind of like those Nantucket sailor Quakers who'd seen firsthand what slavery was like, and realized a military occupation of another people who have indigenous ties to this land isn't the best way to provide security for Israel. And so they work to take people, mostly uh, Israelis themselves, uh, into the occupied territories and let them see for themselves what's happening. They're an amazing group, very, very brave and courageous because they are despised by the far right in, in Israel, but bravely work for reconciliation. And they, they have no political agenda about one state, two state, three states, confederation. They say, we just have to end the military occupation so that we can then work towards how we live together. Another person I want to talk about is Abuna Ilyas Shakur, who's an Israeli Arab, a 1948 Arab. He was a Palestinian Melkite Christian, grew up in a little village in what's now northern Israel before the 48 war, and was exiled you know, when the war happened and the Israeli forces occupied their village and then later bombed it into rubble, even after the Israeli Supreme Court said they had a right to return. The day they were to return, the Air Force came and just bombed it into rubble. And he is now the Archbishop, the Emeritus Archbishop of the Galilee, working for reconciliation, established a school for Jews, Christians, Muslims, and Druze to learn how to live together. In the best of times, they have all of those in the student body. And when he talks with our groups, he says, uh, you have to understand that we're not born Jewish, Christian, Muslim, or Jews. We're born babies. And we've got to understand the other and learn to live with each other. Wonderful reconciler. You can look him up. Of Elias Shakur, his uh, best book, probably to get a sense of his work, is Blood Brothers. Blood Brothers. And then I want to talk about the uh, bereaved parents circle. These are Israelis, uh, uh, Arabs, uh, and Jews, and Christians, and uh, West Bank Palestinians, Muslims, and Christians, who have lost their children to the violence. Each of them has a harrowing story of losing a child. And after an initial desire for revenge, uh, some to, you know, one person we've talked with was a sniper in the army, and he had all the weapons. And when he learned that his daughter had been killed by a suicide bomber, wanted to go out with this and take out 13 Arabs at random, the number of Jews that had been killed by the suicide bomber, and realized, you know, I can kill 13 or 26 or multiples of that. It will never bring my daughter back. I've got to find another way. And that story is multiplied by many in this parent circle. And I, I, I watched uh, online the movie you saw last night. They're not about forgiveness. 
They, they, that's not up to us. You know, God or Allah can do that. But we've got to stop the cycle of violence. Mm -hmm. We've got to find a way to make sure that nobody else suffers the way we have suffered. And it's an incredible work that they do. It's so effective in talking about reconciliation. They've been banned from Israeli schools. <laughs> uh, because, well, we can go into that later on. The last group I want to talk about is uh, Ten of Nations. This is a Palestinian farm, uh, the Nasser farm, uh, who owned their land. They've owned it since Ottoman times. They have the papers. But in the Oslo Accords, they wound up in Area C of the West Bank, which is totally under Israeli control. And there were four settlements on the hilltop around their 100-acre farm who want that land. If any of you are familiar with Naboth's vineyard in the Hebrew Scriptures, 1 Kings, Naboth's vineyard, it's an exact story of offering a blank check. So, no, it's, it's our ancestral, and we can't sell it to you. Then we'll destroy your crops. We'll destroy, they burned down thousands of their trees. We were supposed to be there last, this week, right helping them uh, pick olives. Uh, but, you know, we couldn't get in uh, because of COVID restrictions. And in spite of the fact that there are demolition orders on every structure above ground on a farm, that's fences, barns, cisterns, they have no utilities, their road has been cut off, so they have no access to the main highway. They have a stone at the entrance to their farm that says in four different languages, we refuse to be enemies. And they invite settlers to come in and experience their life. And they're living there on a hilltop overlooking the Nasser farm with all the running water and utilities and amenities you can think of. And they come and visit the Nassers and say, why don't you have water? Why don't you have electricity? What? And they can see them, but didn't know until they were welcomed onto the farm how different their life was just a few hundred yards away. I think that is your work. <laughs> I think that is our work. How do we get to know the other? How do we get to meet these people who sometimes don't live that far away, but sometimes mentally, even physically, they, they do. But we can overcome those boundaries. We can overcome those barriers you know, if we can see them in the light that they have within them. So anyway, let me end it there. I know we're uh, right at the end. Uh, any quick questions? We'll, again, we'll be around for lunch. Yeah? Well, I have a question about the Quaker um, tradition in the Underground Railroad. Railroad. Were they active in east, northeastern Carolina, Perquimans County? Yeah. Uh, you know, northeastern, uh, it wasn't just the Quakers, but many others were involved over there because mm -hmm. uh, the Great Dismal Swamp was a magnet. And a lot of Maroons lived there. In fact, they had whole communities uh, in the Great Dismal Swamp of fugitives from slavery. Uh, and then from there, they could work their way up through Virginia, up through Pennsylvania. From here, the route, though, was up through uh, what's now West Virginia and on to Indiana. But, but yeah, there was a lot of activity out that way. Is Sutton a familiar name in the Quaker community? There are, yeah. Sutton... Uh, it's not a, a major name down in the Piedmont, but... Uh, in Eastern Carolina? Yeah. There was a, I think there was a Sutton's, Sutton's Creek meeting, I think, at one point. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I want to bring some themes together about this conference. Uh, forgiveness is being vengeful for the past. Forgiveness is about the future. Water is very important to what we are. We are travelers. This group is a bunch of travelers. The illusion of owning real estate, the idea that what happened even 100 years ago is no representation about what is reality. It's all about an illusionary history, uh, slavery, the ownership of people. What do you think? And, and the last thing you mentioned about the uh, occupation, the occupation is about controlling the movement of people. Because looking back about England, about you were talking about the foundation of Quakers and primogenitor, where only the oldest son inherited property. Everyone else was footloose. So what about bringing some of those things together? I mean, the ownership 
the ownership of land is a historic illusion. Mm -hmm. We are all free, and America represents that. I mean, which of us lives in our home that we were born and raised in? I would dare say none of us. And we're all happier for having done it. I was never so happy as when I saw my hometown in a real uh, and, and And we see it now with the movement to the coast and the growth that our children are living in the cities. They don't want to live in the little towns. Now, little towns are idyllic, and it's been, you know, the illusion of that has been praised in American history. But that's not the future. So if we can get, tell me about how you see the future in Israel and Palestine. It's not a two-state solution. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, physically, it's impossible now because of the facts on the ground. Uh, so what Israeli and Palestinian peace partners we work with are saying now, we want uh, one democratic state where we can live together. There are various ways that, that could happen. Uh, one of those that some of our friends are working on, again, both Israelis and Palestinians, is one homeland, two nations. You can live wherever you want to, West Bank, Gaza, uh, Israel, uh, the 48 boundaries, but you're a citizen of whatever country you choose, Israel or Palestinian state. But if you're a settler in the West Bank, you stay there, but you're a citizen of Israel. If you're a Palestinian living in 48 Israel, you live there, but you're a uh, citizen of, of Palestine. And some of our even most radical Palestinian nationalists, activists, have said, you know, the Settlers are now indigenous. We can't drive them out. They've got ties here. Let them live there, but let us live here as well. So there are these kind of creative ideas that are percolating that haven't gotten traction yet because we've got old guard politicians on both sides uh, who don't have the wherewithal to do that yet because they lose their... Power. power. Because their power is based on historic injury. Yeah. yeah. And, and by the way, I have to, okay, a little personal background. I spent some time in Georgia, the Republic of Love, mm -hmm. where my wife was working with uh, internally displaced people from the, the Soviet invasion. And what you learn is that the political power structures are not interested in the displaced persons being integrated into society because that alleviates the injury they suffered from the invasion, right? If, the, if you don't resettle, if the people who are displaced are not fully integrated into the society, then you can continue to pick at that scab and the <coughs> return of what? The property you just lost, which you only historically had from what knows what. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I, I I thought your observation about real estate, because I've heard that the war in Palestine was about water. And I think that's an offshoot of real well, estate. Part of it, yeah. But that's the major resource there. But they, they only have, they have a rainy season <laughs> from you know, November to, to April. And uh, you've got to replenish the aquifer. And right now, because of the occupation, Israel controls all the resources, even in the Palestinian West Bank. And Israeli law allows... Israelis and settlers to drill to 300 meters or no 800 meters. Palestinians are only allowed to drill to 300 meters. So guess where the water table is gone? And that's a huge issue. And they're and the major aquifers go right through the West Bank. It's Palestinian water. The Palestinians who live in the West Bank have to buy their water from Israel at five times. Because. But that's no different from California, yeah. right? That's no different from the Rio Grande. That's no different yeah. from Lake Mead. Water is the issue, yeah. and it's not about growing crops, which we also heard about the other day. This is about water to feed people, mm -hmm. to develop human potential, which is not, by the way, going to realize itself by growing agriculture. Yeah. That is a dead end of humanity, right? Mm -hmm. We get enough food. We, all, we know we can grow enough food. Human... We were about realizing ourselves, not about getting tied down to the soil. Mm -hmm. And I say that having never been a tie to the soil, you know, I, like I said. So, so can't we break that cycle by getting people to realize that it's not the olive grove in your grandfather's backyard that you want. 
What you want is a future for your children where your children realize their potential. And their potential is not going to be realized by swatting all those under a tree. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that our partners are talking about. They don't think they're going to see a just peace for themselves or even for their children. They're, they're working for their grandchildren. They see this as a long, talk about long patience. So it's a long process, and all those are, are key issues. Yeah. So I have a quick, I have a comment. I mean, being the only Muslim here, I have to um, thank you really for doing the work that you do because I personally hear of a lot of Muslim organizations that go to Palestine and do the work or from outside of Palestine and help them. But think, listening to you and, and looking at you doing the work and kind of making it a purpose of your life, I, I would like to thank you from all your Muslim cousins. Oh, well, well, thank, thank you. And you're all welcome to go with us. We ever get allowed to go back in. <laughs> the COVID restrictions have wiped out our last two summers, but uh, well, inshallah, think, next time. I'm not personally as optimistic as you might be, yeah. because I see it as a, such a dead end, because Gaza is really an open prison. Mm -hmm. Children don't have access to clean water to drink. I mean, there is no possibility of a two-state nation because right. one is so huge and the other one is just like dying. I mean, like, you know, they're just yeah. dying. So yeah. I, I wish I had that much hope as you, <laughs> but I don't. And it's just kind of sad. What gives us hope uh, is the people we work with. I mean, they, they have hope. And we go there for our three weeks and we say, you know, how, how on earth? And they say, well, you know, we have long patience. He said, you know, remember we go back thousands and thousands of years. We see change. And, and I mean, when I went in 1970, Israelis didn't recognize Palestinians. Palestinians didn't recognize Israel. We've seen that change. And so I've seen incremental change. So you begin to believe it's possible. And things over there, I mean, it is the, the land of miracles. <laughs> uh, things seem to happen overnight. But the power structures on both sides have got to change. They are so entrenched and ingrained that it's very difficult for the, the real grassroots organizations of Israelis and Palestinians, like the Reed Parents Circle, like Breaking the Silence, like Al Haq, to, to bubble up. In fact, the way power structures try to tamp it down is some of you probably have read that six Palestinian human rights organizations last week were declared terrorist organizations. We know them. <laughs> they are as far from being terrorists as you can imagine. But because they're speaking truth, you know, they've got to be stamped out. Yeah. This is a good thing. I mean, how do you even begin? How does an ant begin to fight an elephant? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> That's a good you know, and it's weird, it's me, I'm an American citizen, and my tax dollars are funding this. I mean, how do I even comprehend this? Yeah. I mean, the only way we can is we take people there. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. And then we tell the stories. And I'm, I'm terrible at it, because I just give statistics and stuff. Jane tells stories of encountering Nadia. <laughs> whose home was destroyed by American military might, you know, when the army came in and welcomed us with hospitality, served us coffee, even when our tax dollars had just about killed her. And we have to tell the stories. And we've seen some change. When we share the stories of been people have actually changed. We haven't been successful with our congresswoman yet. <laughs> but we keep trying. Yeah, sorry. Thank you so, so much. Winkers were silent people. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> something new Thank every you. day. Thank you. Um, I wanted to say that the last thing you said was, it, it ties in so beautifully with what we do with Sarah We go into people's homes, we meet them, we, we make friends, and then we share those stories with others. And I think that's ultimately what leads to world peace. One, one story at a time, one trip at a time. And I would love to go on one of your trips, too. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm I'm gonna ask, is that Arabic? Yeah, Okay. means welcome. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to put in our little questionnaire uh, an 
interest sheet and see who wants to go on his uh, trips and maybe we can get some information from him. Yeah. All right. So thank you and well, thank we'll you. see you in the cafeteria. Yep. Ten minutes before lunch is soon. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you all.